Okay, I think it's about time that I got a, another video out here, considering it's been a month since my last video post, and technically two months since my last official video, because I don't think that last one really counts. Anyway, fat stacks update. So, uh, right off the bat, you can see that there's a lot that has changed. Uh, I said that I was going to stop doing updates and such in video and start doing them on Twitter, so that's where I've been posting a lot of these updates is on Twitter. Eventually, I do also intend on putting them on Planet Minecraft, but I digress. So far, um, what I've decided to do is I've actually decided to completely scrap what I've already done with the Fat Stacks project and start over because I realized I had actually made a design mistake. Uh, and so I had misinterpreted the language that was uh, created by Ender Scythe. Having gone back over it, I realized that I can actually add a lot of the features that I was omitting in the previous version. Uh, but whilst I was in there tweaking the system, I figured I may as well just do a complete overhaul because I actually realized that there is a way to pipeline this and I'm super happy that I figured this out. Um, in order to actually demonstrate this, I'm actually going to do something a little different here. That is until I hit the wrong button. Let's try this again. There we go. Nice little white screen for you. Or a whiteboard. Yeah, so this is the previous model. Uh, that I was working on in the last couple of videos. This is a fairly standard uh, multi-cycle CPU architecture. So we've got the registers here and here. These are primarily your general purpose. This is going to look like boobs if I'm not careful. Uh, this is your general purpose um, registers. These are your address registers. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have the address cycle loop here. Uh, we also have the uh, data cycle loop here. So this, of course, updates the address. This updates the data itself. We've also got some miscellaneous stuff. Uh, and basically, this is all controlled by a state machine. That's the basic theory of operation. This is something that you should already know if you've watched the previous videos. And then this is the new architecture. Now, mind you, the, um, the control is still a little bit of a black box because we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, but I, <clears throat> if you look over the architecture you can kind of see especially when you compare it to the instruction set that it's running it can't really be pipelined uh, because we're doing access to io well not really io but we can be doing access to io and memory multiple times and so that's not something that's easily pipelined because typically a pipeline you can only access memory once however if we were to instead pipeline the microcodes instead of the instructions themselves, all of a sudden now we can actually pipeline this. So going back to Minecraft. Um, so with the previous multi-cycle system, uh, state machine would for every clock cycle feed an instruction or a microcode into the uh, execution unit. And the execution unit would then execute that code and that code is typically, actually it was always some form of a move. It was either moving from register to register, register to memory, memory to register. It was basically just a move. It was, was what it boils down to. And it was these combinations of moves that allow the computer to do more complex instructions. Uh, that's kind of the basic principle of all of these computers, really. But um, I think what I was trying to do with the previous iteration, what I failed to do was pipeline the entire instruction. But uh, little thought popped into my head one day, why don't I pipeline the microcode? So now this circuit still gets the same, in theory, still gets the same instructions uh, from the state machine, but instead of taking one clock cycle to execute them, it takes four. Now that sounds detrimental, but understand that because the data actually has to flow through a smaller section of the computer each time, the clock cycle should be faster. So it seems like a trade-off now, but also because this is a pipeline, we can actually fetch one instruction per clock cycle. So we get the advantage of a faster clock cycle while maintaining the execution of one microcode per clock cycle. That's the theory anyway. I have a slight feeling that we're probably going to run into some dependencies uh, that will slow the computer down, but I think uh, uh, designing it like this uh, should reduce dependencies because we're not having to, of course, wait for branches and things. This should all be figured out uh, in real time. It's not like we have to wait for 
uh, flag to be generated before we can fetch the next register. That's all going it, to... It's a little bit complicated. It's kind of difficult to get out of my head, but hopefully as time progresses and I develop this further, uh, this should make a little bit more sense. And I think this is also kind of suiting the fact that I'm actually starting to explore uh, pipelining and stuff because this gives me an opportunity to actually talk about the execution side of the CPU. Usually I just talk about the control side. But anyway, back to the whiteboard. So this is the design so far. Um, this is sort of the more uh, comparable to the physical layout of the design. But these two are basically the same. This is just a more simplified version. But basically, we've got a register file. Uh, we've got an execution unit. We've also got an address calculation unit. And we've got your memory right here. Let me go ahead and delete all that. Um, and then this is just your write back. So fairly standard um, pipeline. And then of course there would actually other uh, be another stage here. And this would be your uh, state machine right here. And this would be what would feed the microcodes uh, from the instruction queue to this is the basic principle. Uh, but as far as why I designed or why I chose this design, uh, when it comes to these pipelines, there's really not much variation. Uh, so you'll often see the very standard fetch, decode, execute, uh, and write back, of course. But um, for it just so happens that this particular design works for what I needed to do. So uh, we have, of course, our register files, uh, which can be um, uh, can be f filled with uh, immediate data or data from the stack or the popped stack, which is all going to be in a RAM. And uh, where that immediate data comes from, you may have noticed there's no immediate input. Well, that's basically just that register right there. So I'm going to treat the immediate input from the state machine as another register is what it boils down to. Uh, we also have this U register. This is actually the data input and output. So that's also going to be treated like a register. Uh, and the idea is that since a lot of this data is just movements between registers, um, putting them over here should uh, keep things simple is the idea. Uh, but anyway, register file contains the A and B temp register, the IO and the immediate. Uh, and then of course that transitions to the next side, which is the uh, the execution. This is just an add or subtract or nothing too terribly fancy. But uh, I also have the address calculation portion of this separate uh, as compared to the previous one where technically it was separate, technically it was connected. Um, so this was uh, the reason why I chose to do it this way in the previous model is because uh, data could actually occasionally move from memory uh, to the PC and it needed that direct path from the execution side to get to the PC. Uh, but you'll notice that there's no PC in this uh, in this control unit. This is actually going to be part of the state machine and part of the instruction fetch module, which I've yet to design. Um, but we've got a stack pointer and we've got a popped pointer. That's about it. And this is your basic uh, feedback system, which can both increment and decrement and choose between pre and post. And that just feeds the address directly into RAM like so. So then once uh, data has been calculated and address has been calculated, the RAM can then do what it needs to do, either sending data into RAM, getting data from RAM, or just passing it right along because in, in all honesty, there will be occasions where we won't actually be accessing RAM. So this just allows us to bypass it. And then of course, your very standard write back. You can also take your write back information and send it back to RAM, back to the uh, execution unit or straight to the to the registers. Um, so that's a fairly basic pipeline model. Anybody who's really familiar with a pipeline model already knows that this can pretty much do uh, anything that a multi-cycle system can do. Uh, now, like I said, most people typically design this and have the instructions that are executed be the ones that get fed in. Like I said, I'm doing a little bit more complex instructions, so I had two ways of doing this. I could either do a more complex pipeline uh, or just pipeline the microcodes, and that's primarily what I chose to do. And I know a lot of people uh, say I have an obsession with x86, but can you really blame me? This is That's actually kind of where I got the inspiration, because if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's how uh, Intel is able to pipeline their super, super complex instruction set. 
is they just pipeline the uh, the microcodes. I could be wrong though, don't quote me on that. Uh, but anyway, going back to the physical model, we can see sort of the same thing going on here. Um, so I've got the stages color coded. So there's the address calculation unit and this is the data processing unit. Uh, and there's four stages, so there's four colors, and then the buffer latches are indicated by orange, so there's five uh, in this, uh, in the data processing unit. There's only one in the address calculation unit. And I can actually compare that to uh, these registers you can see here. I'll even draw it in orange so you can see. There's one there, two, three, four, and five in the um, data calculations uh, section and only one in the address. So it all matches just fine there. Um, but those are all of our uh, stage buffers is what it boils down to. So we've got two outside the registers, which is dual read for now. I might convert that to single read, but I still need to work out the logistics of that. Uh, we've got a buffer just outside of the, uh, of the processing unit. Uh, and then of course the buffer uh, that comes just after the RAM. Uh, I'll also get to what this is all about here because this is a little bit of a mess. Um, and then of course the buffer outside of the address. This basically just splits the uh, address processing bit into two stages. This way the RAM isn't actually waiting for the calculation to occur. And it should be something I can get away with because there's no dependencies on the address. Or the address isn't dependent on anything so I should be able to do that just fine. Uh, but of course we've got dual read memory. Uh, right now we've got the A and B. I've yet to actually implement the IO and the immediate input. That gets buffered and goes into the adder subtractor, which um, the first stage is indicated in red, second stage is yellow. So there's the adder subtractor right there. Nothing too terribly much to that. That basically just passes it through to the buffer. But you also notice these are yellow because again, um, the uh, address calculation and the uh, data processing stage are all on the same stage. So that is why that is marked in yellow. So all of this happens while data is being calculated here, gets passed into the buffer. Uh, and then we've got this mess. This is, the, this is the tricky part because in order to get all of this to work, um, I actually had to have the right lines or the right back lines, both on the top and on the bottom here. So you'll notice that the the memory's output, which is down here, uh, that of course gets uh, muxed with the pass-through line uh, and then goes and splits down there. And then if you follow this line, sort of, kind of, maybe, possibly, here, there, I think, yeah. Right along here, it also passes up to the top here. So uh, this is basically like two giant loops, if you will. So this inner section here is actually traveling from the registers through the uh, processor to the RAM. And then these two right back lines kind of split from the RAM up and over and then up and under. And the reason why I did that is because uh, we have dual read registers here and we can choose to select the register uh, or select the right back line. And that's because of uh, dependencies if it happens that we are writing or reading from a register that hasn't been written to yet or is about to be written to we actually want to pull that data from the right back line and not wait for the register um, but we have those muxes that take care of that and so this mux uh, splits between the a input of the or the a output of the registers and the top feedback line and this mux splits between the b output of the registers and the bottom feedback line little bit of an aesthetic thing here, but in hindsight, since this right back line doesn't actually go all the way back, I could actually lower this and make this flat, but uh, that's just aesthetics. I'll fix that later. Uh, anyway, so like I said, this, um, this takes the output of the uh, buffer, which comes from the processor, and then uh, I have no idea. <laughs> it's a little bit of a mess. Um, first thing it passes through of course is just the buffer or uh, the, the the mux and this actually just takes it directly from the uh, feedback line here so we can actually pass data that's coming out of memory back into memory if need be um, but that 
uh, gets mux there. Then it passes into the input of the RAM, which is currently non-existent. Um, it can also go back round through here, which is then mux with the output of the RAM, and then we already saw where that went. So that creates the entire uh, loop. And then the only thing that's left is to attach the RAM here, which I've already got this set up to the correct height and everything. So the um, the RAM will be attached here, and the address will come from here. Now, the nice thing about making this separate and making this you know, setting this off to the size, um, I don't have to do this funky wrap around with the address bus like I usually do to get it to work because the address bus is already off to the side. I can just send that directly into a uh, decoder and then these would be your read and write lines. Those can control the AND gates which can read and write from the various segments in RAM and then the RAM can be just right over here. That should clean things up quite nicely. Uh, and then normally I would put the IO there but I'm going to try and put it over here and there's a good reason why. Um, and that's, again, aesthetics. Uh, least significant bit is on this side, which, if you're a traditional uh, binary type of person, uh, you'll always put the least significant bit on the right-hand side. So having it on this side means you can kind of face it and it's all it all lines up. So that's the reason why I chose to do that. A yeah. little bit of a little bit of a out of the out of the blue kind of moment. So I, I'm still trying to get back into the flow of this but i think for what i've got so far this has turned out quite nicely now uh, again this is all theoretical i actually haven't tested any of this stuff yet um, but being that it is a pipeline i feel it uh, would do it more justice to test it in a fully operational environment which means we're going to need to create some control units now the nice thing about pipeline computers is the control units are very very small so it shouldn't take me too long uh, but basically, all I, uh, this is why I've got this big gap down the middle, is the idea is I'm going to have my instruction queue pass through the middle here, uh, and then I'll just grab from various stages uh, underneath and send it directly to the control units, which will then control the various control lines. That's the idea anyway. Not sure how that's going to look, in all honesty, especially considering that stage 4 control lines are all over the execution unit and then stage two control lines are here and then all the way over here so it's going to look a little interesting but uh you know that's part of the challenge so that is what i've been working on and uh, i know maybe some of you are going to be a little disappointed because this is going to push back the fat stacks project by quite a bit i basically just started all over again but i think the final result is going to be well worth it uh, if i do this correctly and uh, if my assumptions are correct this model should be substantially faster than the previous one but we'll see where that goes so thank you for watching and uh, i'll see you in the next update